Hello, everybody. I am extremely excited to be here with, of course, with Catherine. And um, today we're going to talk about time travel. Uh, Catherine is like just perfect for this conversation. It's a part of our Meaningful Trends series. And we're diving deep into the, of course, uh, Catherine's personal vision for the future. She, I think she's got uh, an interesting expert um, sort of insight into this, comparing maybe to sciences, to people who are, let's say, can calculate things, but I think seeing things and feeling into things is a, is a very interesting way to perceive time and future, myself as well. Definitely, it's, a, it's I think it's a gift, could be a curse, <laughs> I guess, for some people. Okay. It could feel overwhelming. Um, uh, and you have such an interesting story also about, you know, your gift and how it woken up in you and how it's kind of changed what you do as well in the world right now. So we're going to talk about all of this. And I would love to welcome you here in Meaningful Trends channel. And let's uh, begin with introductions. Can you please tell people what you do and uh, touch a little bit on your that story, that transformation that happened for you when that gift of um, seeing into the time, whether it's past or future, came to you and how is it unfolding now for you? Well, first, thank you for having me. I think these kinds of things are great fun. I have been, I've been training concierge and frontline personnel for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I have been flying under the radar for 60. I was born, um, I don't like to use the word psychic, so I use intuitive. And I was born clairaudient. Over the years, I developed clairvoyance and clairsentience and empathy. You know, I'm a very empathic. I feel energy. But in the 1960s and 70s, if you told people that you heard voices in your head, they would lock you up, give you medicine and put a straitjacket on you. And I was bullied. So I didn't want to be stuffed in somebody's locker. So I kept it to myself and I didn't tell anybody. And I mean, I didn't tell anybody for like 45 years, but I got messages for people and I would get messages as I was going on and teaching in the concierge industry. And I would just, you know, flip the language. I, instead of saying, you know, I would say things like, uh, I have a feeling that dot, dot, dot. Have you ever considered dot, dot, dot? So I'd give people messages, but they wouldn't know I was giving them messages. They look at me like I was crazy half the time, but it's all good. So about two years ago in 2020, I met a woman named Dr. Katie Nall, who we were in a session and I started giving her advice, flipping the language. And she stopped me being seriously intuitive and said, stop it. I know what you're doing. You have to do this professionally. So I'm going from a business background to moving into a world that I've actually always been in. I just didn't tell anybody that I could do it. That's about as short as I could have ever said it to anybody. And 20 years ago, I saw myself doing this, but I really thought it was somebody else that I was seeing. And I didn't realize it was me until about two years ago. Mm. Very interesting. Very interesting. So right now on a regular basis, you're consulting people with what? I have discovered that everybody on the planet is intuitive. Every single solitary person watching this broadcast is intuitive. And you get your information via various channels. You either see it, feel it, know it, or you just could sense it. Some people smell it. They, they get their, I mean, there's like 12 different ways you can hear the other side on the other side of the veil and you can get messages from the angels, from spirit guides, from whoever. My, but as you get older, everybody kind of has a lane. You've got a specialty as it were. And my specialty seems to be falling into past life regression because if you've got a phobia, you can't sleep at night, you can't shake something. The original cause might be rooted in a past life. And by understanding what happened back then helps you move into the future. So, and I, and I also see the future as well. 
my timing tends to be a little off. So I will not tell you you're going to get hit by a bus Tuesday at two o'clock. Not my gig. Um, I may tell you not to leave the house. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't do that kind of thing. Don't get the lottery numbers. Lord knows I've tried. It doesn't work that way. But I, I do see the future and, I, and I'm very good at pulling out people's past lives. I've gotten really good at it. Surprisingly. Amazing. Amazing. So um, let's look into the vision, your vision for the future. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, when I'm asking people who are creative, who are intuitive, who are visionaries, and not just visionaries in the sense that they are, you know, free thinkers and they can, you know, really maybe uh, strategize things and mm -hmm. uh, calculate how it could unfold. I think that's pretty logical. There's logic in everything, right? Um, but people who are like literally see things, right? So I would love to hear what do you see? What is the uh, your personal vision for the future? And we're looking for maybe 20, 50, 30 years ahead or whatever yeah. you see, because you know many of people I've spoken with already thought about the topic and maybe had some hinges and had some interesting realizations and visions around that. The world's going to be different than the way it is today. And I mean, radically different. The world you see now, I, I've often said to people, you have to break something to fix it. So mm -hmm. while our world today may seem like it's going crazy and everything is going, everybody in it is going mad, what's really happening is the earth is kind of breaking things to fix it. Moving forward, I mean, if you look back at the 1950s and 60s, when you were starting a business, people used to tell me, well, you have to think with your brain, don't think with your heart, you have to work hard for a living, and you've got to make money, and it's going to be a long, hard road. That's a whole lot of hooey, as far as I'm concerned. You have to start your business from your heart. You have to run your life from your heart center. And 20, 30 years from now, people are going to do this naturally. The mm -hmm. world as we know it is going to be completely different because it's going to be a world filled with that's, that's love focused as opposed to money and power over others focused. There's going to be more communities. And I also think technology is gonna really advance, but I don't think that the human component is gonna go away. I, I've always seen, it may, it may sound strange to people, but I've always kind of seen that we're all gonna kind of be in little villages. And I don't mean we're going back to the stone age. I mean, we're, it's like neighborhoods where we're gonna help each other. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be a community because the world does not feel like a community right now, but it will be in about 20 to 30 years. Mm, I love it. I love but it. It's going to, it's going to get, I, I hate, it's going to get worse before it gets better because most, some of us on the planet know where we're going and some people don't. I kind of, I, I liken that to them being fast asleep. So it's kind of up to us to shake them up and wake them up. Very interesting. Very interesting. I'd love to ask you about this um, and, you know, maybe some ideas here. Um, my second question would be about, you know, what should we do now? So maybe that comes to this as well. Um, you mentioned that, you know, we should start or in the future, people will start choosing or doing things, you know, especially like, for example, building a business or whatever they do mm -hmm. from the heart um, versus for the sake of success, money, and maybe material things. Um, I wonder what will change on the conscious level to for people to get that. Because I think the biggest transformation that is happening right now is the change in consciousness. It's the, yeah. we, we are seeing how kind of consumerist culture, materialistic approach to life is, um, you know, got us as far as we, I think, as we could come. And seems like our next generation might not, not only they already, many of them announcing they don't want that world, but it seems like on a practical level, they might not reach the same amount of, uh, let's say, wealth, 
uh, economical stability and things like that? Is it that people are giving up on that and just looking to spirituality, passion, and you know, heart as a this is the this is where we need to go, or is it going to be like the culture war between well, we still want to be you know pursue pursue that idea of success that's been right. you know, for us you know for the <laughs> thousands of years right for humanity and somehow we're gonna um sort of have that maybe new generation or, or i wonder how how is this shift to passion oriented life will happen it's all about the money isn't it if you look at our world right now we're very money centered we're centered on you know, you got people who are living hand to mouth with a dollar fifty in the bank, and cause so they're they're completely in stress and financial stress because it's all they can think about. Then you have the people that have too much money, but it's still all about the money because they always want more. And now they're thinking, well, now I got power over you. So in the future, money is meaningless. It's all about relationships. Do you really think you came down to this planet to earn money? You came down for a reason. You came down to learn something, to help something, somebody, to create something. You didn't come down to this planet to make $100,000 and go to a nine to five job. You, you're here for a reason. You're here to help somebody else by being somebody else. Maybe you're here to help somebody be good or be whatever. That's where our world is going. You know, money is money at the end of the day is meaningless. At the end of your life, you're not counting your dollars or the raises and promotions you got. You're actually looking at the relationships and thinking, wow, I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. That's the world we're going to. Mm -hmm. Now for the moment, and this sounds like I'm a crazy person, but so be it, there's going to be literally two worlds in one planet because you're going to have the, the, you're going to have the people that just don't want to hear what I'm saying. It's almost like I'm invisible to them and they just don't want to hear it. And they, they're all about the money and they're about the fighting and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then you're going to have those of us who are literally moving to a fifth dimensional age, which is where we're all going. So for a while, it's it's almost going to be like this. But in 20, 30 years, I really predict it's all going to mellow out and we're going to be more heart centered. We're going to be working because we want to. We're not going to be working because we have to. That's mm -hmm. really the difference. I do this because I want to, because it brings me joy, because I can genuinely help people. I can genuinely fix people. Not always, but I do try. But I don't do it because it's making me money. I'm doing it because I love it. That's the difference. You, you know, sometimes you have a nine to five because you need the money. Now, I'm not telling everybody to quit their job and just live in love. You might starve to death. But I think that you should follow that little bird on your shoulder, which is a which is a book I wrote because it can see farther than you can and listen to his advice. Well, ignore the fact it saved my life three times. Seriously, trust that little bird on your shoulder because it's going to lead you down the path to where your highest truth is and where your life is supposed to go, as opposed to the money trail. Where everybody says to you, that's where the money is, you need to go in that direction is probably not where the money is for you. Everybody's a snowflake, we're unique. So I try and tell people not to listen to anybody, including me. They really just need to listen to the little bird on their shoulder. Mm, yeah, that's a great advice. I uh, We've done uh, several panels here where we discussed kind of what's gonna happen in the future from you know this point of view, meaning that, mm -hmm. When people had reached uh, economical sort of bliss, if you want, stability, there's no poverty in the world, there's a, you know, good, secure, um, basic life. Can we go there now? For everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, Please. that's why, that's me why up. Like, I mean, we were, we were thinking about, you know, with the progress, there's a lot of people I interviewed who are, you know, actively working with in politics or in science mm -hmm. or technology to ensure that's going to happen. And one of the things that always comes up, and this is kind of a big topic of mine as well, is kind of what happens after we achieve success. One of the things that I've realized personally for myself that that kind of 
devotion to passion and uh, love uh, relationships as well for me came I've actually also always followed my passion so I don't have experience of not doing that but on a different level from a different perspective much deeper much more I would say um, committed it came to me later in life when I was I didn't have to provide I didn't have to hustle if you want right I always call it afford we could we have to be being able to afford authenticity because majority of us compromising throughout our own lives just like yourself you said you mm-hmm. hid and didn't talk about your stuff of course right because it's like well society doesn't take me on until I am able to actually be fully independent and now right. I can do whatever heck I want <laughs> because I don't I don't depend on on um, all of that formality that is uh, and the children are grown and you can you you have a little bit more free time yeah so I wonder kind of what needs to happen for humanity in term economically uh, for everybody to reach that point where they can just focus on relationships on love and be you know be so free about choosing and, and you know like really exploring passions because there's always infinite amount of things we could do as as right. create in this world right so what would be your advice to people right now who are you know wherever they are so some of them of course are young and they're just starting out lives and they may be thinking oh i have to get this job to survive and uh sure in a few it's like how is that am i going to be like my parents putting my passions aside until i can or um like what what does it really like what do i supposed to do now or or for people who are in the midlife or, or whichever age it doesn't matter it's like do you see an answer do you see what each of us can improve right now or work on or do something maybe it's nothing i don't know right it's 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 kind you want to of- have your cake and eat it right. too it's like in the 1970s when they said women can have it all. We can, you know, what, what's that old TV commercial? You can uh, go ahead, go get the bacon, fry it up in a pan. I mean, we can have, we can be all in one. I think it's a matter of perspective. First of all, my advice to everybody out there is it's never too late and it's never too early mm-hmm. for the perfect age to start exactly where you are. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday because I have no power in yesterday. I only have power today and in the future. There's no power back there. Can't do nothing about it. So it's the perfect time. And if you're one of those wildly busy people and you've got three kids and two jobs and you're, you know, everybody's going where you're going to ballet, you're going to soccer, you're kind of one of those families you're in the perfect place. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of starting your day and looking at it in a loving way as starting your day and looking at it in a lack way. Whenever I was in business over the years and I had a problem, I ran a concierge association for 20 years and you know the you know what would hit the fan on a regular basis. And I would actually say to myself, what is the most loving way I can solve this problem. Mm -hmm. What is the most loving answer I can give to my son so this will help? And then I would listen to the little bird on my shoulder and the answer would come. What is the most loving way I can get money into this house without losing my mind? You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's that kind of perspective. It's looking through, uh, looking at the world as a world that's positive and filled with love because it's there. If you look at it, if you turn off the news, if you read between the lines, it's there. We're making huge strides in modern medicine. We've even, there's, if you go out and actually search good news, it's out there. But if you live in lack and I'll I'll tell you a story, really fast one. Years ago, I decided to do a little test. And I decided over the course of two days, the first day I was gonna look at everything negative to see what would happen. 
And then the second day, I was going to go back to all the same places and purposely look at the positive. So the first day I went to the post office and it was a long line and I got upset because everybody was upset and the line was long and the person was nasty. And then I went to the grocery store and there was somebody in front of me who had just had this wonderful trip to Japan, but all she could complain about was that she had blonde hair and they all wanted to touch her hair. Okay. <laughs> and the, you know, the day went on like that. And by the end of the day, I was nauseous. I thought I was coming down with the flu, went to bed early because I had a massive headache. It literally made me sick. The second day I went back to exactly all the same places and I went to the post office and I saw this mother sending a care package to her son who was fighting in Afghanistan. I went to the grocery store and I saw rows and rows of food that could feed hundreds of people. By the end of the day, I had a song, I had a dance in my step and everything was great. And I saw some opportunities and some really positive work emails just magically came into my inbox. What did I do differently? It's perspective. How are we going to get to this world that I see in 30 years? It's perspective, anticipate and expect that it's going to happen. It's called the law of anticipation. It's the law of assumption, law of assumption. That's the one, the law of assumption. You're gonna assume that we're just gonna magically get there. I think the ways and the hows are going to get there. It's the scientists and the bankers and the politicians, but we are going to get there. And it's up to us as the general public to just assume that we will and teach our kids accordingly that the world is a loving place. Hmm. I love that. I love that message. So, of course, I would love to ask, I think maybe everybody wants to know this, <laughs> that how is your work with past life regressions ties into that? Because one of the things we, I think we talked about before coming here is that, you know, I believe that too, is that healing is necessary for people mm -hmm. to have that brighter future just what you said changing perspective right. in itself is that miracle is that shift is that biggest transformations any of us can do and right. that it should do it's like literally this is what you need to work on is having faith in a, in a better future and yourself that you are worthy that you are lovable that you are enough as you are because so you're not living under that you know, guilt of being yourself and what's wrong with me and everything that's been put on you. And now, just as you uh, being a healer, you know, I've been healer for, you know, since 17 years old, so 30 something years now. And I find that the biggest, the fastest way to help people to shift that perspective is to actually reach into the spiritual origin and say, listen, you're not just here this time around and you do have a lot of wisdom and you have to be able to see yourself more than just a physical sure. flesh and body there is more to your life than just um is that your first rodeo <laughs> no and of course now uh you are working with past life regressions and i think mm -hmm. it's an amazing tool um whether it is a psychotherapy or in psychoanalysis when you're looking into your childhood and to start understanding the you know, why are you so triggered by those things? Why do they bother you so much? Why is it so hard for you to just shift perspective and just be positive and have faith in people and trust everybody? Like, what's the problem? So we can find all of those patterns originated in the past. And in your, uh, the, the way you work with people, it's actually looking into something that is beyond even what we right. remember, what we know. So can you tell us about maybe... Um, share with us like a tool or process people can do when it comes to something, you know, something maybe unexplainable. So I call them irrational fears people have. You mentioned those around the future and how can they help themselves besides, of course, coming to you and seeking professional help um, to open up to that new perspective that you're talking about? It's hard to move forward if you've got a phobia. I can't. Well, why can't you? I don't know why I can't. Let mm -hmm. me give you an example. I'm going to, I'll, I have a personal example I can give you, and I'm going to give you a client of mine. He called me and he was in tears, 28 year old young man. He was in tears. And I mean, tears, like crazy tears. 
and he wasn't sleeping. He hadn't slept. And he's a cop, by the way. He wasn't sleeping. He hadn't slept in weeks and weeks. He was at the end of his rope. He said, I understand why people commit suicide because I will do anything to get this to stop. So I got quiet and I went within and I saw a lifetime where he was a sheriff in a town and it was the night before Easter and his wife killed him and smothered him with a pillow. And he called me the night before Easter. And all his life, he had trouble with relationships and getting a girlfriend. And well, of course he did because a woman smothered him with a pillow. And after I pulled that lifetime out of him, he, he said he felt a, a lightness in his chest, right in his solar plexus. And mm -hmm. he started dating after that and he didn't have any more sleep problems. I, over the years, I had a lot of money issues and I regressed. I, I, it's hard to regress yourself, but I had a friend who, who helped pull it out of me. And apparently I was a banker in the 1929 stock crash and seriously believed that I was the reason that the crash happened and the bank folded and all those families, you know, ended up homeless and died very young. So over the years, money would slip through my fingers. It was like I had a leaky bucket. I would have it, then not have it, then have it, then not have it. Because of course, if I had money, then I couldn't hurt anybody. So not having money, I can't hurt people. So if you've got a phobia, you've got a fear of heights, you've got a fear of relationships, you are bouncing from job to job to job, there might be a legitimate reason why you're feeling like that. And whenever I, whenever somebody comes to me, the lifetime that's causing you the most trouble is the one that's going to come through. I had a client who was having trouble in their business and they just couldn't get it to move forward. And I regressed them and I saw that they were in their last life, they were slaves and they, they were trying to get away and they were, they had gotten themselves into a canoe and they, they didn't have any paddles. So they were trying to paddle with a stick and it wasn't getting them anywhere. And they were trying to get away from these, from these people by paddling with a stick. And as soon as we pulled that lifetime out of them, they started to get clients and things started to flow. So it's crazy that something that you are not consciously aware of, it's the ultimate intergenerational trauma, right? I mean, it's the ultimate of intergenerational, but something back then clearly affects you today and probably has over the centuries. Now, why is it clearing today? Because you're ready for it. And our world is you have to get rid of all of these old stuff so you could move into this new age that we're talking about today. You have to let it go. Let it just let it go. Yeah. So what would you recommend to people who have, let's say, rational fears about the future? What can they do knowing that, there, you know, there's a process or maybe there is a way to understand what's going on with you? Um, how, you know, so one of the things, of course, you're mentioning is awareness, right? It's like, oh, it's awareness. If you've got a legitimate fear of the future, it, not everything is a past life thing because it's not. Sometimes it's a, it's a, my parents were horrible thing, <laughs> you know, not everything, but some of the big things are 100% a past life thing. If you've got a legitimate fear of the future and it just polarizes you, it could be that you were killed somehow, um, you know, in a horrible way and the future that kind of maybe it reminds you of it. So if the first thing to do is just, I, I suggest to everybody to start with guided writing. So find your favorite place in the house, outside the house, under a tree. I don't care. Turn off all your technology. Yeah, there's an off switch on your phone. It's there. You can turn it off or at least mute it. Get away. No dogs, no spouses, no kids. And just have like 15 minutes to yourself. Get a pen, of, get a pen and a pad of paper. Or I type faster than I write. So I usually do it in my office. So the, ask a question. The first words that form in your head after you've asked the questions, I don't care what it is. It could be a vision. It could be a picture. It could be words. Write it down blind. Don't even think about it. And then ask another question. And before you know it, you've got a conversation and you're off and running. That's how you tap into that little bird on your shoulder. And you can call your little bird anything you like. Doesn't matter to me. But if you tap into that, that higher self of yours, that 
inner voice, that's how you're going to get where you need to go. I love it. Thank you so much. That's my amazing. pleasure. So, and where can people find you and especially the book as well? Um, I love for them to, because you just describing, I guess it's in the book, right? You describe the whole process. And I think for people who do feel um, fearful around, uh, about the future or even about present, right? Uh, you know, they feel like, well, just like you said, I don't know why I'm scared. Like, there's nothing, no real reason besides, you know, whatever other reasons right. <laughs> other people are talking about. But inside of you, you think, well, there's something else. I do have that unexplainable fear. So how can they find your book and you and your work and connect with you? Well, the book is called The Little Bird on Your Shoulder. It's available on Amazon as an ebook, audio book. There was an experience recording that and a paperback. Um, you can, and I'm, I'm kind of crazy. I got two websites, CatherineGiovanni.com. And Catherine is spelled a little odd, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E. And that's kind of my business website. You can also go to GuidedTalk.com, which is the more spiritual website that I do with a couple of other women. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. My I mean, pleasure. It's amazing. And I think um, I, I know that the, for a fact that a lot of people are, you know, struggling through the times. Uh, it's been hard. It's been hard, not just factually, but because, you know, it seems like there's no way out, right? There's right. not that many positive perspectives out there. <laughs> you know, this project, I created especially as a therapist maybe more than anything else it wasn't just even about future it was mainly about healing people right this moment and bring them hope bring them faith and help them to shift that perspective because just like you said if you didn't shift it if you're sitting in that negative point view i'd be dead it's, i'm a cancer like, survivor and yeah. the only people say, how did you survive stage three cancer, which I've completely licked and the oncologist has released me, yay, um, perspective. I literally didn't take any negativity. I literally looked at them and said, I'm not going to get all those nasty side effects. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to take the express train and not the local where I get all the things. And I did. And it was a matter of looking at things positively and looking through the glass differently. That's how I got through it. That's why I'm still here today. And that's how we're going to get to that future. Thank you so much for your, for your actually creating that shift now for people. I'm sure they are right now receiving it and thinking, oh, it's so good to hear the stories of survival. It's so good to hear the stories of miracle because it reinforces that faith in in you that yes there is a brighter future there is you you want to make that effort why not why not to play in this life why not to what do they have to lose involved participate and um and just have you as a role model have inspiration from your work and of course use your process for um you know more serious work when it's taps into those fears and helps you to actually uncover them and release them don't die until you're dead, people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. My pleasure.